In Romans chapter 1, we have to... In Romans chapter 1 is a brutal chapter. It's a confrontational chapter to a lot of things, but I'm going to read 17 through 22. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that right there, boy, I could go on for a while on that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of, there it is, he said it. The qualifying nature of this is that Paul's talking to people that have a relationship with God. I had a pastor friend of mine make a comment one time because someone said, man, you're, told him, man, you're friends with so-and-so, so that must make you, and he said, hold on a minute. There's all kinds of friends. There's a phrase that came out, oh, probably about 20 years ago, called frenemies. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All kinds of friends. So anyway, let me, let me, let me continue here so that I don't keep you past noon. Thank you, Brother Christian. I appreciate that. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Oh, church, God, that can't be you and I. I can't hold the truth in unrighteousness. I can't have the truth and be unrighteous. But is that... Is that not... Can, can we just... Put the facade down for a moment and that's our struggle every day. I know the truth, but there's just a side of me that unrighteousness feels so much better. It flows a little better in my life. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. This next short phrase is very important. So that they are without excuse. And this is, this is the point. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. To know God and to put anything else as a priority makes us a fool. I know it looks so wise to be successful in this world. I know it seems so important to have your ducks in a row, but then to find out your goose is cooked. Oh, Jesus. That word glorified, they glorified him not, literally means to praise, to extol, to magnify, celebrate, to honor. Wow. God, I want to praise you today. God, I want to extol you. In other words, I want you to be the focus of anything that I give it. I want you to be the culmination of what's important. The word magnify is tricky because can we really make God bigger? <laughs> to celebrate. We can do that. I want to celebrate God. 
I want to I want to put other things aside that buy for my attention and and, and and my praise that I will celebrate Jesus because ultimately that's who I want to honor that being said the same speaker Paul in 1 Corinthians makes a statement verses 57 and 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God. Look, I'll be honest with you, it's easy to, man, I'm thankful that I got a car that's so far has started every time. And, and that has helped me daily, but nothing's helped me more than God. But isn't it so natural just to, I'm thankful for my house and my car and this, that, that and we give all that honor and explanation and we neglect God. But the real victory comes through God. Because my vehicle, my finances, my worldly successes will not get me to heaven. Only God can. So thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, listen to this, folks. Be steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding. In the work of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, I got a few things I got to take care of, but nothing will I abound more in than the work of God. I'm going to be stubborn about it. I'm going to be steadfast about it. It's going to be undeniable what's important to me. For as much as you know, you have to reverse engineer this to understand. The labor in the world, no matter how much adulation, Pats on the back you get from your neighbor, from the fellas, from the men's club, from the ladies club. Still in vain because he says, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, geez, this, this is what matters. This is what, this is what's going to tip the scales, really. This, this is really what puts treasure in heaven. This is really... What and get, this is the real bank account. This is the real success. I just want to speak for a few moments on the lost art of glorifying God. The lost art of glorifying God. Let's put our Bibles down. I want us to pray and talk to the Lord right now. And Seek his, his face. Jesus, we love you. We need you. We want to glorify you, God. But sometimes we seem so caught up in the things of this world and the things of our life that we lay aside what's so vitally and eternally important and give our attention to the things that will pass like a season. Lord, help us. Give us focus this morning and allow me to bring forth your word with clarity to the precious saints of God that are here in this church today and those online. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. There's a portion of scripture in 1 Kings. It's two verses that Kind of sneak by. First Kings chapter 12, 28 through 30. Whereupon the king took counsel. Notice it's a king and counsel. And made two calves of gold. Listen to me, folks. And said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You ever notice the world wants to tell you what's too much when it comes to God? But it'll never put restraints on the world? Listen to me now, folks. Behold thy gods. He's telling it. Behold thy God. I'm going to tell you who your God is. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, these golden calves. Look at this guy. And he set one in Bethel. Oh, what? what? You're going to set one in the house of God? 
You got to be careful that your true worship, though you're physically here, you're mentally there. You're socially here, but you're mentally there. And he set one in Bethel, and he put the other, he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin. Old Testament using the word sin, yes. For well, the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. There's an idolatry today. It's kind of an archaic word. We create idols and we worship them. And idolatry today is the idolatry of convenience. In this portion of scripture, my thought, how does one allow for a terrible act of idolatry in this manner when Jewish history documents the anger of God that was followed by that severe punishment at the foot of Mount Sinai for the creation, for the very same thing of a golden calf. The duplication or the the his, the repeating of history. How how could this happen? And really, it, prospectively, so soon. Yet, can we be honest? You ever notice? It's the same old, same old with us. Maybe not with you. So let's pick on Pastor. It seems easy. Yeah, here he goes again. How many of us, day after day, week after week, year after year, it's the same thing that we go a worshiping? We say to God with our mouth, but our lives are all about something else. We justify. We 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 know God, but we don't glorify Him as God. It's the old saying, and it really applies here, that if we don't learn from history, we are bound to repeat it. And I know that's not you, but man, I have found in my life that if there's just, I can't put it away, I can't push it aside for a while. There's just some things, sin or not, it's got to go. Because it keeps me from honestly glorifying God. It, it causes me to become too important to myself. It causes me to become and to place things more important than my Savior, who really gives me the victory. See, because it wants to tell me that my victories be successful here and that everybody knows who I am or everybody thinks that I'm some great thing and I'm actually trying to vie for attention that belongs to my Savior. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When you compare that narrative in Exodus, it says, and they received them at their hand. They were willing to give all their, sus their gold. It's, it's funny what you'll give all your gold to. It's funny how you'll justify it. And fashion it with a graving too. after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, who was or brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When we read that, we that's perplexing. How can, how can they really be that ignorant? Right? Really? Pillar of fire? Cloud, you just watched a bunch of uh, uh, people drown, and all of a sudden, the man of God's gone for a few minutes. He's up on a mountain conversing with God. And in a matter of moments, you go from living for God to dancing and prancing around metal image. It could be a pile of currency and the image of something that you really do love and not a golden calf. You have to understand the region where they're at and what that led to over there. I'm not going to get into that today. How do you find yourselves falling into blatant idolatry 
again? There are many answers to this question, but there is one answer that stands out in relation to the context of this story. It's very simple. And it's almost been lost in my dialogue of the golden calf, but I want to redirect you back. Because the enemy wants to make true worship a burden. It's very simple. The king wanted to get his nation to remain in their lands and not go to Jerusalem. I don't want you to go and really worship. Let me make it more convenient for you. Let me make it easier on your pocketbook. Let me make it easier on your social status. Let's make it easier on your conscience. The Bible talks about a seared conscience. The enemy wants to sear your conscience, your, your conviction. He wants it to, to be confused and, oh, you're condemning me. No, you need to allow conviction to do its work. Are you hear what I'm saying? So the king said, oh, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. The king is saying, you know, it's too much. I can see the temptation of convenience as it worked its way through the households of the land. And we can see it there, and I see it here. I can see and hear fathers and mothers parents sitting down, you know, it's been a busy week. Lord, I'm tired. I don't know if we can go all the way to Jerusalem today. I can imagine the other conversations taking place. You know, it takes too long. Too much effort. It's not, it's not easy on the kids to get them all ready and dressed up and get them in the car. And I, I got this going on. I got that going on. And, you know, I, man, if I tell you what, the donkeys are getting tired and the camels are wore out. Man, I, my tires are getting a little thin. Maybe I'll, I don't know if I got gas to get over there today. It costs too much. And, you know, it's cutting into my work schedule. It's cutting in, it, it's kind of, it's messing up my priorities. Now, I'm sure there were more reasons, and I could probably have spent more time on that, but the main argument was that was likely made was around inconvenience of going to Jerusalem. That is really all the devil has to do when trying to destroy some people's walk with God. I just got to get him to stop going. I just got to get them distracted. I just, if I could just give them an alternative, just make them think about, you know, it is so difficult and time consuming. And let me give them access to something that seems like a viable alternative, the old bait and switch in this new age online church. I'm seeing this played out on a regular basis, and it's not like this is done in the corner, and I'm watching even stalwart saints find reasons, you know, a little inconvenienced for me right now, and nobody likes to be inconvenienced. In fact, there's such a paradigm today that if it's the will of God, if it's right for me, it's going to be easy for it to happen in my life. When it comes to jobs, wait, wait, you wanted me to show up on time? I don't know, did it say that in the job description? Did, did, hello? I, I came to school, what, now you want me to actually sit here and learn something? Look, you're stretching it now, pal. <laughs> We're laughing. But this paradigm is very real. Come on, folks. You go sit down in a restaurant, you want the waiter to actually wait and not look at you like, what, you want me to bring you food?
Nobody likes to drive a certain distance to church, even though they've got no problem driving several hours to the beach or to the mountain or to a place that fits their leisure category. Nobody likes to drive off church, but it's a steakhouse across town. If it's Jump City for the kids, if it's that fishing hole, that hunting spot, the idea of inconvenience is that it causes you to devalue the purpose of a pursuit. To drive a distance for work, what are you talking about? You, you need a job. You better get there. I don't care how far you got to drive. And I don't care what time they tell you to be. You need to be there. School? Get up and be on time. Make That's a priority. Eat? You got to eat. Get up. Get, get, hey, you get, need that food in a timely fashion. I got to get back to work. We'll go and drive distances for for. School, eating, shopping, activities, etc. It, it's acceptable, but God needs to make serving him a little bit more convenient. I ain't got time to get up on a Sunday and get over to the house of God today. And what, now you want me there in time for prayer? Come on! Oh, wait a minute. Read my Bible? <sighs> You're stretching things, church. Who does God think he is? Does he think he's God or something? There's easier ways to go about this. God needs to get more modern. We, we got to modernize the church. Look, don't, don't come to me and say, man, keep the altars in here, but then you won't be on time for prayer. Get the music right, get the doctrine right, but you don't have to really participate. Make sure the Air conditioning is proper, but your temperature can be ridiculous. Because that's convenient for me. Doesn't God understand that I just don't always feel like going all the way to Jerusalem? And the world is providing me another way? It's the same thing, right? too hard to get the kids ready and out the door. We'll just stay home and watch online today. Costs too much gas money. We'll just stay home and watch the online service. Church is too early. I'm tired. They don't understand the work week that I had. Maybe I'll go next week. I'll listen to the archive service sometime today. I'll, I'll put it on when I'm driving to work. I may not listen to it, but it'll be on. Folks, we're watching right now as a Society that once that in God we trust has completely lost connection with that same God. But people die a slow spiritual death simply because of an idolatry of convenience. We're watching marriages and children and relationships all die and the, the plan of God be distinguished and, and just eliminated. And I don't mean distinguished, I mean extinguished because of convenience. You're sitting side by side, but you're looking at your phone so far from the person you're sitting next to. We sit in church, and that's all we're doing, sitting in church. I've even known people who have left the truth by attending a church that's a little closer to their house. Why? Convenience. Convenience. Don't get me wrong. I spent a long time with a young man that was making good money but was broke. And he came to me because he wanted to be used. And I said, listen, if you don't get your finances right to where you're honestly living for God, look, I, I can't elevate you. And he said, well, I don't know what's going on. I said, well, let's sit down and go over it. Nothing better than someone that wants to be transparent with the man of God and say, well, let's look at my finances. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I have trust in the man of God over finances because I was, you have to understand, and I learned from my pastor, and this is how he treated me. I put a big offering in the church one time. He called me up. What are you doing? You don't hear that much anymore today. That's too much for you. That, 
and he went down what tithe and offering was. He says, and I said, no, 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 no. I received uh, some money from something. And it, and it is, and it, okay. What man of God calls you and say you're giving too much? None. You, you, go ahead. You can try me and drop that big old check. I'll be calling you. Well, I hope, I hope because if the secretary has to tell me, because I'll be honest with you, I, don't, I try not to pay attention to that because I don't want that ever to sway me. So you have to understand, I, I, look, I'm looking out for your soul. We could be going broke and I wouldn't know it. Well, no, I hope the secretary and hope Erica and Sister Davenport would pull me aside and say, hey, uh, we in trouble. <laughs> well, we do have a roof to repair and a parking lot to fix, but I'm, I'm trusting God. If the devil can get you, if the enemy can get you, if the world can get you to start thinking and getting you to view consistency and commitment to the house of God, a burden, then he's already sown that seed that can lead you to a spiritual demise. When you start checking, start thinking, I got to go to church again. I got to do this again. But yet you're running to work and you're running to play and you're running to party and you're running for hobbies and you're running for this. And you never question that. But everything about the house of God is, come on, you, you're feeling me. Galatians tells us, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But today's ideology has rewritten, or Pastor Crow has rewritten the verse because of some folks have brought it, bought it hook, line, and sinker about convenience. This I say then, Walk in the flesh, and you will not fulfill the love of God. <laughs> Some people struggle, well, God in this and God in that. You, you are walking in your flesh. You're wanting so much from God. Walk in the spirit if you want to get there. But you're living at, at, at the altar of convenience. In other words, where's that big baby I talked about on Wednesday? Got that great big ball and that big old lollipop. Nah. You see what I'm talking about? Everything's about you. And we know God, but we stop glorifying him as God. God is all about order. Why are things so sideways? Our world is out of order. It's taking man and woman, and they're trying to blend it like there's no difference. It's, it's confusing our children. It's confusing Everything. It's just more convenient to stop telling them about science and stop preaching about biology. Lo, don't stand up for truth. Oh, God, I'm just tired of dealing with it. Just let them do it. And the church has become almost anemic to just get along with convenience. Trust me, the enemy knows how busy we are in this nonstop digital age. And he will do everything in his power to increase your frustrations that will cause you to become ripe for the picking when it comes to the trap of convenience. You can go shopping all day or working on a project all day and I ain't got time. I, I have to make it Sunday night. I don't feel good. I'm not going to go. Psychosomatic illnesses or plagues seem to come out of nowhere. People can busy themselves for hours doing all sorts of things, and all of a sudden, an hour before church, and an illness has come out of nowhere. Now the church must be contacted. Let's all rush into prayer for this sudden outbreak. But it's disingenuous because, in reality, it's really just poor planning and inconvenience. It's not an illness or a disease. Can we be honest? Because going all the way to Jerusalem is an unnecessary burden. So just let me worship the golden calf at home. Romans, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature. This writing almost separates us from the honesty of what it's saying. We worship man in his ways more than God in his. Paul warned about idolatry. And, I, I, and I'd like to paint an easy picture, but it's not easy. Living for God is going to be work. 
And at times, it's going to be hard. At times, it will cost you. Because that's really the only way it proves you. It takes a rugged determination to make a mind up that says, no matter what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will be in the house of God. Every moment that the doors are open will cost you commitment. It will cost you other distractions to make that decision. Altars of convenience at Bethel and Dan will never become viable substitutes for the real authentic worship in the house of God. Sadly, I know many have decided to go to Dan rather than the inconvenience of serving the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Trying to say clearly today, don't fall for the tactic of convenience. Because pretty soon the mindset will not only cost you your relationship with God, but it will cost you your relationship with your spouse and your children and your responsibilities. And soon a full destruction will take place. True worship, while it may tax me, must never become a burden. There are times when I need to drag this old carcass into this house of God, weary and tired and spent, and stand to my feet and lift up my hands because I will glorify him as God and that I just won't worship at the altar of convenience. I've seen myself drag this carcass up on the wee hours of the morning to make it to a job. I've jumped up at the beat of an eye, bat of an eye, to get to do something in an emergency that was important. But all of a sudden, bless God, if I'm going to serve him, it's on my time and at my comfort and convenience uh, causes me to stop glorifying him as God and make him something less. The victory that Paul talked about has true value. Attitude toward God is found in your giving. Your effort towards God is a part of your worship. No different than your effort towards your spouse. Oh, let me back this up because some of you kind of let that go a little bit. Your effort for your spouse before they were your spouse. Because you could talk for hours. Now y'all can't talk for five minutes without fighting. Because the bottom line is, the world is confusing thing. Can I, can I meddle a little bit here? I'm going to say something, ladies. I don't care what the world's telling you. Your man wants to be married to a lady. Hey, fellas. And your lady wants to be married to a man. The last thing a guy wants, a guy will argue, fuss, and fight with his buddies, but he didn't want to with his wife. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, lady. Ain't no man liking a woman that acts masculine. That whole ghetto stuff, it may be cute in the music videos, but it sucks in the house. Hey, guys, that effeminacy out there, and maybe all cutesy for commercials and all that other bull corn, but they know a woman here wanted a feminine guy when there's a knock at the door. Ah, no, this ain't evangelistic preaching, but I'm telling you what, I'm just trying to get some household right. I'm trying to get some hearts right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get some people to heaven to realize, hey, hey, God deserves our whole heart, mind, and strength. Stop lying to yourself. Quit you like ladies and quit you like men. Find that altar with God. Grab a hold of the horns. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. He made me a man. He made her a woman. Bless God. And we will glorify God in remembering those roles. The world is a lie. And it's lying to our kids. Get your house in order, folks. Listen. John speaks. But the hour cometh and now is when the truth. Of time, it's time to live for God. True worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In Second Samuel, it said David built an altar, and God came that day to David and said to him, "Go 
Raise up the altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw, he saw, he was, he's, he's coming up the hill. He's coming up the mountain here. And, and it said, oh, wait a minute. And his servant's coming toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king. Lots of kings today, pay attention. With his face to the ground. When was the last time you actually got down on your face to the king of kings? Don't need to do that. Yeah, because it's inconvenient. And Aruna said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? Because a servant comes to the king. Oh, that we would, re we get a rekindling in that man. We want submissive ladies, but do, we, do they see submissive men? We're too busy being big shots. I can't say it, but bad cases. I'm the man. Make my BLT and bring it to me, because. <laughs> However, y'all act at the house. I don't know. I was raised up in the area of Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and I don't know. W whatever makes you feel macho. God isn't saving macho. You ain't going to make it. You better lay that idol down. David said, you know, I've come to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord. Listen closely here, folks. That the plague may be averted from the people. There's a plague today. There's a plague that causes us to stop really worshiping God and we create our own. Then Aruna said to David, listen, there's, double, there, there's, two, there's two teachings here. Let my Lord the King take and offer what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of oxen for the wood. All this, O King, Aruna, gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God. He wanted to give it. The same principle gets returned because David's like, oh, you don't understand. What you're doing is in order and what you're doing is proper. But right now it is my turn. And so I won't offer something that didn't cost me. He could have very easily in his crown, okay, well, cool, I'll just keep my money in my pocket. It, God was looking at the heart of the thing. And what's funny is I believe David was almost being tested. When you get the opportunity and you think, well, if I knew God wanted me to give that, that's not how it works. No, you're, you're letting humanity, your bottom line, your banking account, Become your God instead of saying, you know what, God, here. I'm going to try here, God. And he was like, oh, hold on here. Oh, my God, he just witnessed an amazing way to serve. He did that before King David could say anything. That offering was given. It was offered. So it was given. He gave it. But the king said to Runa, nay, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Let me just dispel that whole idea. To worship God, it's supposed to cost you, or it's not worship. Come on, ladies. I don't know that he's ever said it, but we've heard the songs. I'd swim the ocean for you. I'd climb the mountain. I worship the ground you walk on. He's saying that because he's saying, no one else will distract me from you. I'll pay any price for you, right? In fact, you at the cost of every other woman on the planet. Makes you feel good, don't it, lady? It better. It should, right? Because you're valuable, more precious than rubies, right? Boy, maybe we need some marriage counseling up in here. Y'all don't sound very excited about it. Husbands, y'all better make her feel more important or something. Take, don't, don't go out with me today. You better take her out. Lord have mercy. And not to McDonald's, you tightwad. Every now and then you need to quit buying from the happy dollar meal and say, wait a minute, taking you for a steak today. I'll fast Tuesday and Wednesday because we can't afford it, but I'm doing it. Because I'm worshiping you, baby. 
Come on, save your marriage. And I don't want that much counseling to do anyway, so get it right. Right? Both these men demonstrated the power and level of worship to their kings. Aruna's offering was no less than David's. Both men were not lost in the mindset of minimums, but maximums when it came to serving God, to serving their king. I want to be at the max. See, minimums will kill you all day long. Isn't it funny how the world demands that, man, you go max out on what? Sister, Sister Carol, they want us to max out on that working out stuff. Extreme this and extreme that. The only thing extreme I got is an extremely fat belly because I like them sweets. I can do the extreme three ice creams a day thing. Three carrot sticks. Now, come on, man. Give me some food up in here. Tell the truth. You can't serve God with good intentions. Write it down. Good intentions isn't serving God. You're not serving God with things you think about. I thought about getting you those flowers, honey. That ain't going to work come Valentine's Day. You better have got them bad boys. My God, are we having a problem there too? Can I get an amen from the fa Buy some flowers, you tight Well, I don't care if she says she don't like them. She's just saying that to appease your backside. Make them feel special. If not, maybe you are special ed and you need some counseling. It's not worship if it doesn't cost anything. It's not a priority if it doesn't preempt everything else in your life. There's got to be something about God that, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to win. Uh, uh, uh. You're not taking my money. You're not taking my time. God gets that. You're not getting, oh, no, no, no. That's for me and my, me, me first. I lead in my house. We're going to serve the Lord. My house is going to serve the Lord. My house is going to be a house of God. What we do in there, what we watch in there, how we speak, it transfers not just to me, but my house. Why? Because it's all his. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're not really glorifying him as God because he's God at church, but not God in my house. I'm, I'm God here. You have to understand the, the point and purpose of the pursuit of God. It's not a matter of inconvenience. It's not, not a matter of, of, of what tries to hinder you, hinder you. It's a matter of I'm going to pursue God because he's God, no matter what's trying to distract me from letting him be God. Your God is proven by what you serve, not what you say. By what you make a priority. You cannot call it worship if it's always done out of convenience because it is about territory. Ownership of time, talents, and treasures. The enemy wants you as territory. Choose you this day who you'll serve. You can't worship at the foot of the golden calf all the world, all week long at the world, and turn around one day a week and tune in on the couch to a church service and call it living for God. Or showing up for one service a week and then not praying, not reading. The devil's a liar. You have to understand he's offering. Ah, you don't need to. It's inconvenient. Get up five minutes before you got to leave. Grab a cup of coffee and head to work. And you'll see God Wednesday night, maybe. It, is, is that not where the world's at today? Don't, don't, don't think, don't think it's, it's not by design. The enemy knows what it is to get you. To get you out of really serving God. And while you have to choose to stay who you're going to serve, your priorities have already declared it. And the enemy of your soul is screaming at the top of his lungs. It's too much of a burden to go to Jerusalem. It's too much of a burden to go to church. It's too much of a burden to tell your boss no. It's too much of a burden to say, okay, I'm going to work here and do this, but I'm going to look for something that allows me to serve the God that I choose. Too much trouble to make church and the kingdom of God a priority. Because that, when they knew not God, they glorified him not. I talked about Caleb earlier, and I want to show you something. How many times have we heard that phrase preached? Give me this mountain. How many times have we centered on the, the vigorous desire of an aged Caleb who, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, confronted 
Joshua regarding Moses' promise that Caleb should receive the mountain region of Hebron. And I heard it quite a bit. I think I preached it about three, four months ago. Right? But what if that mountain was more than a mountain? I'm not going to be much longer. What if the mountain became a stronghold of an enemy or giants? Not because of the land itself, but because of what the land honored or harbored. What do I mean? Really, that, that, that's, that's the point, because in, in Joshua 14, 6 through 13, the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said, And thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee and Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up made the heart of the people melt. There's nothing changed. It's the same thing. Some people are melting and backsliding, and some people are staying on fire and living for God. It's the same thing. It's a mirror image of right now what he's talking about. And he goes on. He says, as yet I, I am as strong this day as I was the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then. In other words, I have not allowed the distractions of even those that could not believe to deter me from my faith in God. What he say? It's 40 years. You're going to be surrounded by backsliders. But if God's your God, you're still going to be on fire no matter what's happened to you. Do you realize that the mountain that Caleb wanted was none other than Hebron? Do you realize the ramifications and the details of what that means? He wasn't just an old man wanting a victory. He wasn't just some guy wanting to pad his life stats to look successful. Look, I got a mountain too, guys. Come on. Yeah. House, car, wife, mountain. No, it wasn't that. It was bigger than that. It was deeper than that. It was more spiritual than that. What was so important about Hebron? I'm glad you asked. In Genesis 23 and 2. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He goes on to say, And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. This mountain had meaning. This mountain contained a covenant. This mountain became something to care about. This mountain was something to be concerned for because it contained a promise and a covenant with Almighty God. And you just don't let that go. Oh, there was territory that needed to reclaim. I want my covenant back. I want the covenant back with Almighty God, and I'm not letting it go. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. It means more than just going in and owning something. Sad. Some of you have decided because you own something, you're successful, but you forgot about possessing something that is of a covenant value. You see, it was tied to its foundational ancestors whose lineage is tethered to the covenant of purpose. Some of you are tethered to problems. That's not purpose. Some of you are tethered to these things that mean nothing. They're not an inheritance. They're landfill. It's not a coincidence that giants came to occupy this land. Is this not how strongholds often develop? on the remnants of our past connections. Yeah, sure. I've always done this. The part of me, it's just, it's, it's the good old days. It's like, yeah. it's idols. But yes, amen. Strongholds. Yeah. Thank God for a Caleb who's willing to lay claim once again to Hebron. I, I couldn't help but think of David when I realized this and, and see in the midst of the Valley of Elah saying, is there not a cause? Here we are with an understanding of 
we got to get our causes correct. Oh, that there were some saints today. Oh, that there was someone today. Oh, that I wasn't just pastor up here preaching. That someone would have got a hold of what I'm talking about today and realized the, the danger of, of, of falling into convenience and the danger of having possessions but not a covenant and the dangers of not realizing that there's a cause that is before us. You see, see, because I know that it's missed because there's someone here today that if your children don't hear you stand up and say they're a cause, they'll never have one either. You ought to proclaim to your children like David did. Is there not a cause? That's why we get up. That's why we get dressed. That's why we're faithful. That's why we go. That's why we pray before we eat. That, that's why we fast. That's why we read our Bible. That's why I'm on time for prayer. That's why I take having a pastor and a church. And I can't take heaven serious. It's the covenant that I'm involved in. It's the power and the drawing of glorifying God as God. You don't relegate it to that of social amusements. Oh, Grandpa Caleb, he was laying down a legacy. People were dying, but his grandkids were watching. Yes. Man, Caleb's the oldest man in the camp. My, 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 look at my grandpa. <laughs> he bad. <laughs> Grandma happy about that. Why? He wanted covenant. He didn't want the mountain so everybody knew he was Caleb. He was Caleb because he wanted the mountain. Oh. He was leaving a legacy of commitment and determination to a covenant to Almighty God. It was worship. Ah, I'm giving my life to something bigger. I'm giving my life to something greater. David, when he uttered, is there not a cause, realized that the covenant was behind the giant. And I'm bringing this too close. The covenant, the victory, was behind your giant. Come on, come on. That very thing that you can't let go. That very thing that you think is a status symbol. <laughs> it's a giant. Oh, well. Whatever your giant is, and it's up to you to find it. It's up to you to be honest. It's up to you to seek the covenant. It's up to you to find the head run of covenant in your It's up to you to realize what you're really fighting for or losing your soul for. Because it's easy to overlook. But the giant is merely a distraction from something that was been purchased with blood in the past. First Samuel. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko. There's a little phrase here, which belongeth to Judah. And those who know your Bible can already preach this message. It belongs to who? Then what's the giant doing on it? You come and sit in here and you can't stand in praise? Yeah, come on, come on. I love the way you shout and scream. I love it, Christian. I'm glad you're here. Some of you. You get so excited about all your little toys and all your little, and it consumes you. And you come in here and Jesus. you got giants. You got giants standing on your covenants. You got giants possessing your inheritance. Your grandbabies ain't getting jack off. And pitched between Shoko and Azekah in apostamine. Now, apostamine means a twisting and a turning. You know what that means? It's talking about that struggle you have of getting yourself to reveal. You're going to live for God or not? You're, gonna, you're in that place of decision. You're going you're gonna to serve God or you're going to go back to your idols. Are you going to get in covenant or are you going to live for what's convenient? Because in order to fight, you're going to have to put yourself on the line and your little precious carcass. Did you hear what it said? Which belongeth to Judah? It's easy to get distracted by the giants and overlook the land upon which the Philistines had. Those borders of blood. 
It's easy for a Benjamite. Oh, Saul. Okay, get this. I know, I know some of this is too deep for some that don't, don't understand this. It was easy for Saul to appraise the property as, you know. I don't know if this church is worth that. I don't know if living for God is worth killing that giant. I don't know if it's loss is going to be that all important to me. Not worth confronting that giant. Some folks will not value the kingdom of God. They won't. But there's going to be some that say, you know, this territory, this church thing, this, this is worth giving myself to. Christ did it. Mm, well, okay. <laughs> you have to understand because of Saul's proclivities, it was easy to sacrifice to the enemy what your family didn't die for. Is it not? Saul held no real regard for that place. You what you think God sent David out of just coincidence? David walked up and realized, this is my inheritance, and they got the Philistines standing here taking this from me? This is from, this, wait a minute, this is my inheritance. This, this, this was given to me and my tribe, my family. This is... See, some of us sit back with all our trinkets and our ideologies, and we think, you know, I'm coming home, and I just want peace in my home, and they don't realize that there's a giant sitting there. It's really mine. It's mine. You're not going to worship God here. You're not. I'm, I'm keeping it for you. You will never get your family in for God. You will never get your family in favor to God because you're wanting peace, and you want status quo, and you're okay with me being camped on your property, and you're up there in your tents all. And God, God said, oh, no, no, I can't have that. that. That belongs to Judah. That belongs to praise. Uh, let me send someone of that tribe. Let me send someone of the tribe of Judah. Let me send someone that's going to value God. That's going to value the property. That's going to value terror. So that's going to walk in. I ain't just showing up to church. I come to praise. I come to worship. I come to defeat giants. I come to be a giant killer. I come to stand for the covenant of God. Hebron means something to me. The Valley of Eli means something. The things of God mean everything to me. God, Hannah, <laughs> you better check your lineage against those who talk against the church today. Be careful when someone makes a comment about the church. Find out who they really are. They may have been a former leader, but if they're not sold out, then you don't want to listen to them. Uh, I don't care what you used to do. I care about what you care about. Oh, I don't care what you used to say. I care what you're saying right now. I don't care about past battles. I care about who you're fighting now. Are you fighting me or the enemy? Oh, you better get an email on that one and maybe I'll give you a phone call. You better get right with the things of God. What are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? And this young upstart walks in and reestablishes what it means to glorify God as God. He turned around against all the odds for a piece of ground. That's all. You don't realize you're fighting for everything that means anything. You're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your grandbaby. You're fighting for a covenant. Hey, oh, you're not going to talk against the church of the living God. You're not going to defy God here. Not while I'm here. I may just be an upstart worshiper. I may just be a praiser, but I got a sling and a rock and an almighty God. Devil, you're messing with the wrong church. You're messing with the long, wrong land. You're messing with the wrong folks. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to glorify God. Hallelujah. Could it be? And Saul was willing to let go of what was not his to miss. David shows up. He valued what was on the line. And he risked 
He risked everything. He gave everything. He put himself fully on the line. And maybe some of us need to reestablish what the real true cause of your life is. Don't assume your children know by what you say they're watching more of what you do. Jim Elliott, a missionary whose service to God cost him everything, made a statement that I believe would resound today for those spiritually in tune enough to hear this preacher. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm not losing heaven for anything this world. Mm -hmm. There will be no confusion as to who I'm fighting for and what I'm fighting for. Jesus himself said, he who is not with me is against me. It's time some of us made a beeline in the Valley of Elah down to the brook and get yourself five smooth stones. Fill your bag and load your sling and start systematically eliminating those giants that are trying to kill the covenant and steal the territory that belongs to you and your children. We are not going to give up the church. We are not going to relinquish the church and what it is. As for me and my house, we will certainly, I'm going to be here when the doors are open. I'm going to be, I'm going to find myself something to do. I'm going to be involved in this thing. This, this, this is the covenant that gets me to glory, that gets me to victory. And I want to glorify God as God. Let's restore that lost art of glorifying God. Let's talk less of ourselves and more about him. Amen.